Good afternoon, to everyone. On behalf of CSTEP, I welcome you all to today's webinar, Climate and Development, Navigating a Delicate Balance. I would especially like to welcome our distinguished panel of experts uh, who will discuss later today our study's findings and guide our research, and also support us from the French uh, Development Agency. As you all know, India is facing a significant development challenge, uh, which are food, housing, clean energy, to its vast population. However, as we steadily move towards these goals, we are also grappling with constraints on resources and impacts on air, water, and water climate. Conventional thinking is that India's focus should be on income growth to meet our development needs. But also, sustainability and climate goals are potentially in conflict with GDP growth. So that's the general sort of view. But there is enough academic literature and other work that says a system-wide approach that considers the interlinkages between these various goals, development, climate, and sustainability, is the best suited to address such complex problems. CSTEP has been working on a project for the past two years or so that tries to do exactly that. So our aim is to develop a set of models and tools to assist policymakers in looking at the interconnected goals of climate development to help arrive at more comprehensive policy solutions. The work we present today reflects the first two phases of our four-phase project. I hope for an enriching and, and an engaging dialogue with all of you today. Uh, with this, uh, I will now invite Dr. Jay Sundi, Executive Director of CSTEP, to offer his remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Priyavrat, uh, and uh, a very, very warm welcome uh, to all the participants uh, in this uh, webinar. Uh, I just wanted to start with a few words. Uh, uh, as, as you all know, the Center for Study of Science, Technology, and Policy uh, was started in 2005 with the express intention of the use of science and technology uh, to give options, a uh, policy options for a sustainable, secure, and inclusive society. With that in mind, while the early days we worked on energy, uh, back in 2009, uh, the then minister in environment, forest, and climate change approached us to come up with uh, targets for India in terms of what are the CO2 targets that uh, estimates of energy, is demand, energy demands of, uh, for India and how they would grow over the coming two decades. Uh, a decade later, here we are uh, actually trying to understand what is it that India will need in the coming decade. Uh, CSEP has been part of various modeling exercises from the Low Carbon Inclusive Growth Committee to working with the NITI, the Planning Commission and the NITI Aayog on energy systems uh, uh, models. Uh, we have also worked with the Ministry of Environment, Forest, Climate Change on uh, modeling analyses uh, to explore scenarios uh, looking at how India will transition its energy requirements and also meet its development challenges. And that is where the real uh, challenge lies. Uh, we have to look at approaches where we have to examine the interaction between the various sectors, which means that it is a complex system because we have various objectives to fill from meeting our sustainable development goals, a primary objective in some ways, but also for uh, the NDCs that we have committed to in our international forum. Uh, there is this notion of long-term decarbonization because we know the issues of climate change are upon us, and it's very important that we have to consider that, which means we have to start looking at the synergies, the trade-offs uh, between the goals that we have. Uh, the the Center for Study of Science, Technology, Policy has always, CSTEP has always looked at computational tools, computational models to help understand or give us insight into issues that we will be seeing decades from now. And I think that's where computational tools are very helpful. We are not here to predict the future, but give insights into what can happen, what should happen, and then finally let the policymakers decide what will happen. Uh, with that, I must commend my colleagues uh, who have worked on this tirelessly over this period of time on trying to 
bring together a new set of tools, a new set of, uh, of mechanisms in the way we can look at these long-term aspects. Many of the modeling tools that we have typically allow us to look at maybe a decade or so ahead. Here we are looking at more than two decades ahead. We're looking at 2050, we're looking at 30 years ahead in trying to figure out what our development pathways are. And to that effect, I think the use of systems dynamics in this manner is relatively unique, I would say, in looking at this particular aspect. There was earlier work that we had done with the Planning Commission, and uh, I would like to also mention uh, Mr. Arun Mehra, who was a then Planning Commission member, worked with us on, those, on that modeling exercise, and he guided us through that, uh, looking at how systems dynamics can be used for some of these. So with that, I would want to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. I look forward to a good discussion because this is not an answer that we are trying to put forward, but trying to get insights into what needs to be done. So with that, I would like to uh, welcome, uh, a very warm welcome to the keynote speaker, uh, Sri Suresh Prabhu, Member of Parliament. Uh, uh, thank you very much, sir, for taking time from your busy sch schedule and as well as parliament. Uh, as, as, as many of you may know, uh, Suresh Prabhu is a C-STEP board member. He's a seasoned politician and an able administrator. And I would consider him a true visionary because he has been able to do out of the box thinking. Uh, he has scripted several reforms across sectors and organizational transformations. And currently he is the prime minister Sherpa to the G7 and G20 summits and he'll be drawing upon India's strategies for these issues. As many of you may know, his role as union minister, he has initiated many development of India's uh, first e-commerce policy, also the national air cargo policy, and also the national green aviation policy in his earlier role. Uh, when he was in the uh, railway ministry, he came up with a lot of real-time customer uh, complaint resolutions using social media. He's one of the most social media uh, aware or savvy politicians that I am seeing. And uh, he's also driven decisions that have had lo very long reaching impacts. Uh, he has made strategic thinking a big part of his public policy development and implementation, and he has mainstreamed the idea of sustainable development. Uh, even though he's a chartered accountant by profession, uh, I think he provides us significant guidance in the issues of environment, energy, water, and sustainability. So without further ado, a very warm welcome to Sir uh, Sishuresh Prabhu and waiting for your words on a keynote address. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, Jay, for bringing this program up and also for making such a brilliant research and thinking on a very key issue that confronts all of us today. And putting together a team of people, experts, who would definitely contribute significantly to the whole process of basic thinking that really needs to go into it. And also to change our age old thinking on these issues and therefore to chart out a very progressive path for not just for India, but for the rest of the world. And India is actually at a crossroads. We'll have a significant contribution to GDP of the world by own addition to our own GDP. So economic output will be increasing in the years to come. At the same time, if you go by historical data, it is also possible that we could contribute to significant carbon load. But as I said, we are at a crossroads because we can actually integrate the development strategy with concerns on climate, concerns on sustainability in such a way that we could avoid the pitfalls of adding 
along with gdp growth not necessarily the carbon load and to make that happen it is not a very difficult thing to do we can actually make it happen as a win win situation in which the overwhelming concern of developing countries is to have development but at the same time to avoid the old traded path of how development should necessarily bring in a significant contribution to adding carbon footprint of the world and therefore we can always come out with strategies and as i said india is at the crossroad and maybe india can provide a model to the rest of the world how can you marry both at the same time development concerns along with the climate related issues very interestingly and it is coincidentally that today while we are discussing the issue the most significant development that is happening in the us if you look at it the presidential election is one significant issue which will happen in the next 50 days but the presidential debate which will start in next few days normally is focusing on issues like economy jobs etc this year of course inevitably the discussion is on corona and everybody thought that corona is going to decide the course of future presidential election and while still it is on that is still a very significant issue all opinion polls in the us point out to that while it is happening as i said today when we are discussing the issue the new such point of debate is coming up is climate change because the west coast is affected by unprecedented fires billions of hectares of land has been devastated large number of people have lost more or less everything that they had so property loss is phenomenal the human lives also have been lost but interestingly the governors of some of the states including california the largest economy of the us us is the largest economy of the world and california is the largest economy among the 50 states of us that is uh, california so california oregon all the governors are saying that this is because of climate change of course the president of us is just saying it's a forest management issue but that's a politics but let us look at to the basic issue of that preceding the heat wave which caused the fires there has been a drought and that drought was unprecedented in some cases the drought has been going for years and that also created a dryness and many plants had died because of lack of water and that created a perfect recipe dryness no water resulting into killing of trees then subsequently huge heat wave along with the winds so that is a very perfect recipe now one can always argue that this is nothing unusual this happens it's absolutely true there is nothing unusual in everything everything happens in history human history has been a witness to so many catastrophes but this particular phenomena that we are witnessing today in california in the west coast in the us is definitely be attributable to something which we as human beings have caused it 
the human induced emissions are now causing climate change, which is proved beyond doubt. Kind of typhoons are hitting US. This is a season for that. In fact, it hits at this particular time every year. But a ferocity, intensity, frequency has increased dramatically. And interestingly, it is hitting the US coast, but it doesn't originate in the US. The typhoons originate thousands of kilometers or in US parlance, miles, thousands of miles away. In the oceans, far away, maybe in Africa or even further than that. But then how does it hit US is because we must realize that we are all integrated. The, the oceans, the humans, we are all integrated. The fires that is happening in Amazon, and Amazon is again having huge forests. So this is not just fires in the west coast of US, even Amazon. And Amazon is not just Brazil and Amazon is one, but Amazon is also integrated ecosystem. And that is causing damage to other parts of the world. So the point is, today what you are discussing in India, Indian context, we are not the only ones who should be concerned about it. The whole world should be concerned about climate. And the interesting part of climate is that you cannot climate discuss climate as independent issue. Climate and the climate change and the issues related to that get manifested in climate change, but they are caused by something else. The energy policy will decide how the climate change is going to be addressed. The transportation policy will decide how do you deal with climate change. Your urbanization policy will have a far-reaching impact on this. Your mining policy. Why? Because mining is also a land use change issue. And land use change again can cause greenhouse gas emission. So each of these many other policies that we pursue is going to have an impact on climate change. Like I was saying that US is sufferer of typhoons that originate in thousands of miles away, but oceans getting warm there and then subsequent journey of that particular typhoon may be hitting the US, but it starts somewhere else. So it's like climate similarly. That energy policy, a mining policy, transportation policy, agriculture policy, all of that going to have an impact on climate change finally. So it starts somewhere else, but manifests into climate change. And all these other policies which affect climate change, we are pursuing it in the name of development. We are saying, how can we have a development without energy? So we need energy. So we pursue energy policy. We say, how can we have a development of any country without having mining? Because natural resources are one of the most principal components, building block for development. So we are pursuing all these policies, transportation, again, a mobility issue. How can you prevent people from being mobile? But transportation, the kind of transportation policies we are going to have is going to have an impact on climate change. So all that which is done in the name of development is actually, if not done prudently, will affect climate change. And what is worst is that we pursue all these policies that result into climate change, but climate change is the biggest threat to development. And climate change is going to affect the poor and the common people more than anybody else. So when you pursue development, you do it for those people who need that development in developing countries. But they are the ones who will be the most affected people as a result of climate change. It's a paradox. And therefore, we have to look at it in an integrated way. Development, climate change, and all the issues. I remember way back in 1998, 
22 years ago. I was a minister for environment and forest. I had 10 different cabinet positions. This was one of them. I said, let us come out with what is the cost of climate change to India? Now, it is very, very difficult to evaluate and quantify the cost. So we said only let us do it with one aspect of it, adaptation. Because for in climate change, one of the biggest challenges, particularly for developing countries, not only for developing countries, for everybody, is adaptation. Because if climate change is a certainty, adaptation is necessary. And when we did that, we found out at that time, in the most conservative way, it could be as as four to five percent of GDP. Now it will be even far, far bigger and more. As Nicholas Stern, my dear friend, and now with London School of Economics, former chief economist of World Bank, and a very fine person had made a report that more we delay, the cost will be higher. So I'm sure the cost is far, far higher. In fact, I always tell Nick that you get given a stern warning. The Nicholas Stern report is a stern warning. But I think we have become even more, as a humanity, so insensitive that however the stern the warning may be, we don't want to listen to it. And some countries have even refused to accept that there is a climate change. So, in today's world, in the name of development, we cannot create a situation in which the process of so-called development contributes to climate change, and climate change in turn affects the lives of common people significantly. Like it is now proved that agriculture in India will be under stress because of climate change. That will affect farmers. The sea level rise, which will happen as a result of climate change, will affect our fishermen, our tourism industry. So all those people who are dependent on their livelihood based on nature will be devastated. And forget the cost of adaptation to the government or to the society, but individual livelihoods, individual lives will be very adversely affected as a result of climate change. So the development cannot be done in a manner that we actually cause disruption to the lives of people. And therefore, we have to deal with very effectively. So I'm very happy to find answer to this very important question. Can we do both at the same time? Can you pursue the so-called development policies in a way that will not cause climate change, but probably mitigate it? Reduce the impact of greenhouse gas emissions. Is it possible? And this answer to these questions can be found out by science. And in fact, the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is a body of scientists. So science has proved beyond doubt that climate change has happened because of this. Now, there is another responsibility of science, one part of to prove that it is there. Like a doctor, the first job of a doctor is to diagnose a disease. But doctor cannot just stop his responsibility at that and can walk out saying, I have done my job. You are at, you are suffering from cancer or some incurable disease. Now it is up to you. How do you deal with this? You cannot, doctor just cannot do that. So doctor's job is to diagnose, but also to find a solution, give medicine, medication, healthcare system. So now the science as a whole have proved beyond doubt, maybe 99%, 98%, they have proved that this climate change is caused by human change, human action. Now the next job is to find out solution through science, to the development trajectory, development strategy that we should pursue to address it. Because nobody can ever agree to say that we don't want development. So development has to be there. But development not, it takes us back that puts us on a forward-looking path. And that science can find solutions. So now I am very happy that Dr. Jay and his team has worked on a precisely the issue. Can we get solutions through scientific solutions? This can make development possible. 
by obviating all the challenges that climate change poses because of development. Now let's take a few examples. And you kept mentioning, and I'm very happy to see my dear friend Arun Mehra is here, who he was a very distinguished member of the then uh, Planning Commission, but a very fine person. He has worked in Tata, he has worked in so many different responsibilities. He was a head of BCG, and he has been fine, but more importantly, a very good person and my dear friend. So he has worked on these issues. He has created a very good report on employment. And in fact, I was trying to take it forward as Commerce and Industry Minister of India. How can we do that? But what I was referring to is energy policy. Now, the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, is trying to change the energy mix of India. 100,000 megawatts of solar power. Another 75,000 megawatts of wind power. Energy efficiency. In fact, I remember in year 2002, when I was the power minister of India, I, of course, introduced so many path breaking policy the reforms, including Electricity Act. But another act I got it passed from the parliament was electricity, was the energy efficiency law. So I set up at that time as a minister of power, first Bureau of Energy Efficiency. I through my administrative order, and I appointed Sashi Shekhar as a founding director of that. And that energy efficiency has proved to be a very important element of India's energy policy. So all of this will change. So nobody is saying we don't want energy. We don't have the wrong source of energy. Don't have, because today even more than 50% of electricity is generated from coal. It doesn't mean we have to discard coal immediately. Again, you can have carbon capture and usage, if not storage. You can have highly efficient plants which can capture coal in a very, the emissions from coal in a very significant way. So we can all a combustion of coal, but in a different way. So we have all the possibilities So energy, transportation. We can have more public transport. Just imagine only a few years ago, only a few years ago, we never had public transport system, the kind of system now we have in some of the important cities, Delhi, Mumbai, Metro. Metro was not there. So everybody had to using their own cars. So that's the transportation policy. Mining. Nobody can say we don't need mining. But we can have mining in a way that pre-mining, during mining, post-mining, we can have different kind of policy. Forest are actually the carbon sinks. So forestation can address this problem. In fact, oceans are also carbon sinks. But the way you are dealing with oceans is awful in the world. And I'm happy that a G7, the last summit that took place in Biarritz in France, the Europeans and generally the G7 community talked about oceans as very important subject. I was there with Prime Minister Modi because India was invited. Prime Minister Modi was invited to participate in G7. And now India is again invited in the, under the US presidency. I hope this happens soon uh, after and President Trump has said after the election. So we'll be looking forward to that in December. But all these issues are very important and all connected. And therefore, I want that we should try to do it. And Jay mentioned about railways and he mentioned about social media. Railways, I had set up the first time in railways history, first time in railways history, which is more than 150 years, a sustainability secretariat, directorate. And we created for the railways, nobody could think about water policy for railways, energy policy. Railways will save more than 80,000 crores, 31, sorry, 31,000 crores on energy because of the policy I put it in place of solarization. And we started the first ever solar train in the world when I was the railway minister. On energy efficiency issues, I started energy audit, water audit for railways. So we again forestation policies for railways. First time I said railway land, let us do this. Point I'm saying is it is possible that without affecting development, in fact, making development better, 
we can actually address climate change. So there should not be any debate about development or climate change. No, it can be both at the same time. No, I'm not saying development and climate change. I'm saying addressing climate change. Others will say, okay, well, let's have climate change. How does it matter? So I think addressing these twin challenges of development and at the same time, improving quality of life for people. What is development meant for? It should be for resulting into better quality of life for people. And better quality of life cannot be guaranteed unless there is a clean air, there's a clean water. The people can enjoy their natural resources as they are entitled to. All of this can happen, cannot happen actually. We cannot enjoy natural resources if there is a climate change. And therefore, we must ensure that we can work on all these issues in a manner that science can find solution. I was coming to that issue of science has proved it. Now science has to find solution. And science can prove how energy policies can be addressed. Science can prove and science can find solution as to how better transportation can happen. As Mr. Arun Mayra, in his days as member of the Planning Commission, had charted out a very good plan, action plan. And he continues to write on these issues in a very forceful, very effective, and a very sensible manner. Because it's not only emotional issues can address such challenges. Emotions are necessary to motivate it, but science has to be at the front end of it. So I'm very happy that CSTP has taken the initiative of coming out with this research paper, which will be a guiding like a religious book, it could guide the policymakers. As I said always when I was a Minister of Environment, that mainstreaming environmental issues into development process is very important. And therefore, at that time, I recommended that each ministry in India has economic advisor. I said we can dispense with them, but each ministry must have environmental advisor. So that whenever any ministry is preparing development plan, whether it's for building road or railways or port or whatever it is, that environment advisor will ensure that these concerns are mainstreamed into development strategies. It can avoid the pitfalls of it. And it not be said that environment or climate change is stopping development because it can development can still go on with all these infrastructure process going ahead with without compromising with the real concerns of environment. So I think we should do that. Science can find solutions, science can guide us. And to do all this, this particular research that Dr. Jay, CHTP and his colleagues have made, will continue to guide the policymakers to marry both at the same time. So science will drive it, science will guide, science will avoid the challenges, and science will ensure that development can go on indefinitely. And that's a sustainable development goal. And that's what we really want, that development must happen in a sustainable way. And therefore, these goals can be achieved without we scoring a self goal. The development goals are goals, but if you don't follow proper development path, then we'll prepare, create self goals. I think I hope you achieve the goal without serving yourself. To do that, I think this report will come very handy. I think this is a very significant contribution by CHTP to this discourse on development. I congratulate the team. And when I can see such distinguished people who are going to be speaking, I think I should not take any more of their time because they are far more competent and eminent to deal with these issues. I therefore cannot keep myself on the dais when such distinguished people are around. So let me offer them best wishes. And I think Jay will continue to engage. And basically, his parents are right to give him this name because they felt Jay can score a victory against climate change. That's why Jay. So I think, hope you, your parents are proved right and you succeed in uh, getting done a job for India and which eventually will be a job for the rest of the world. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, very inspiring words. Uh, and, and I must say with, uh, with, with so much humor that uh, we are all really inspired to work on that. I'm sure the team is going to be very involved. I hope we will be able to reach out to you again as we develop our actions because our goal is to produce options and options that you will be able to help guide in the directions because it's not that we alone have the answers. I think the answers have to come from everyone who's involved in the process and that is part of the process that we have. Uh, so thank you very much for your kind words and uh, we, we really look forward to producing uh, uh, an item that you will be proud of and you will be uh, able to take forward and show to the world that here is what India can produce uh, for the rest of the world. Uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll ask my colleague Priyavrat Bharti to now just take over and uh, say a few words and then uh, uh, continue with the proceeding. Sure, sure. Uh, thanks a lot, Jay. And uh, thank you, sir, uh, Sri Prabhu, Suresh Prabhuji, for, for your comments. I think it was a really fascinating uh, uh, range of ideas uh, you've expressed. And uh, fundamentally, uh, what you said is that we can't have uh, development which is unmoved from uh, issues of sustainability. If you ignore that, then you won't have development either. And or most importantly, it hurt the poor and the disadvantaged the most. So I think that's very, very right. I, we are hoping that from our side, uh, given that there seems to be a fair amount of appreciation and understanding at the top levels of the government to address these issues, our hope is that we can uh, uh, produce whatever assistance we can do in terms of modeling, in terms of research, to assist Niti Ayo, Ministry of Environment and Forest, and other arms of the government in achieving these goals. Uh, thank you, sir, again for your support. So, with that, uh, May I now, now request uh, Mr. Bruno Bosley to share his thoughts? Uh, Mr. Bosley is the country director of the French uh, Development Agency in India. Prior to heading the India office of AFT, he spent several years at AFT's Jakarta office as deputy director, where he focused on areas such as infrastructure, public finance, and sustainable energy. Uh, in India, AFT has been a supporter of work around sustainable urbanization, energy transition, and energy efficiency. Uh, AFT has uh, supported C-STEP's current and ongoing work on sustainable development, including building the safari model, which we're going to discuss today. And we would like to sincerely thank AFT for their close partnership, including their technical guidance. Uh, over to you, Mr. Rosler. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, yes, uh, I was very inspired by the speech of the of Honorable uh, Suraj Prabhu. And uh, the volunteer and our group who in fact what we are doing and uh, together today is uh, it really makes sense. Um, so Honorable Suraj Prabhu, uh, Minister and Member of Parliament, uh, dear Dr. Jayasundi, Distinguished guests and, and panelists, ladies and gentlemen, uh, so very good afternoon and welcome. I'd like first to, to express the sincere regret of Miss Marjorie Van Bellingen, uh, General Consul of France based in Bangalore, who cannot attend to this event today, unfortunately. Please be reassured that she will be delighted to, uh, to contact you later in order to have a better understanding of the system activity. On behalf of the IFD, the French Japan Agency, let me express my gratitude for inviting me today and congratulate, of course, uh, the CSTEP team for organizing this wonderful event. We at IFD are, are very proud uh, to support this ambitious initiative. Let me briefly explain why. Climate change mitigation is a core mandate for IFD uh, uh, worldwide. In, in 2019, we provide more than 14 billion euros worldwide to the financing of the Open Project. We commit to have 100% of our project compliant with the Paris Agreement, and we commit that 50% of them must have a positive impact of climate change. We also commit to support our partners' countries in the implementation of long-term transition strategy in line with the Paris Agreement goal to limit the world average temperature increase below 2 degrees. For that, the French Open Agency has created in 2018 a dedicated facility, the Facility 2050, to strengthen climate policy dialogue on a long-term basis. That is the reason why we are delighted to contribute to the SAFARI project developed by SISTEP, as it will bring added value to the ongoing research on long-term decarbonization pathway for the Indian economy. 
the approach by the lot by this step is very innovative to us. Instead, instead of just modeling climate and energy scenario, it studies the whole nexus between reaching different goals and mitigating climate change factors. It provides, it will provide a deeper understanding of different policy options. We do believe that this project will provide interesting input on low carbon measures and it will pave a way forward to achieve a low carbon and resilient development through economic, social, technological, and institutional transformation as per government of India ambition. We are therefore convinced that other countries and other partners could be keen of replicating such approach. We wish to disseminate the funding of this initiative outside India. So, on behalf of IFD, let me wish to the program and to the system team a, well, a successful implementation of the project and to wish you a fruitful discussion for today. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Bosley, for your AFD support uh, for this project. Uh, Rami, can I now ask you to uh, make a quick presentation? I mean, we've gone through some of the details earlier than the day, so Maybe you can shorten it a little bit, but still, uh, over to you now. Yeah, thanks, Priyavrat. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ramya Natarajan, and um, I'll just give you a quick overview of the Safari model and a few initial insights as well from this work. Sorry. Okay, so um, just to start with some context, uh, India ratified the Paris Agreement and um, as mentioned by uh, Mr. Bruno and also Mr. Suresh Prabhu earlier, um, considering that uh, we still have ways to go to achieve all our um, sustainable development goals, uh, a part of this um, uh, long-term strategy that we need to formulate and communicate, um, achievement of goals is one of the big aspects achievement of various developmental goals that I'll get to um, on the uh, next few slides. Um, and this LTS also needs to take into account sustainability in terms of resource use and um, put us on a pathway towards a low carbon um, economy. So um, based on these, uh, our project objective has been to build a model that estimates the materials, uh, resources, food, uh, and, and energy and emissions for India to achieve its developmental goals. So um, we th expect this model to be more of a um, tool that you can use to generate many scenarios um, and kind of look at how uh, things play out when you change the levers in the model. Um, one of the uh, important things to consider here is to look at all the goals together and the entire system together so that we can look at the interactions and uh, maximize on any synergies that exist between goals and uh, limit the trade-offs. So uh, these um, looking at the system as a whole also helps you identify certain leverage points which uh, can be used to uh, bring about change in a beneficial manner. So uh, with that, I'll show you, I'll just take you through the model structure very quickly. Um, our model is an uh, energy uh, system model which is driven by the developmental goals. So in a, in a way that it's bottom-up uh, estimation of demand. And uh, these demand sectors are... Um, constrained by water, land, and other resources like coal and gas. Um, and we also have a macroeconomic model that is soft linked to these sectors so that um, we can uh, maintain that macroeconomic consistency. And um, the demand sectors also then drive growth in the power supply mix. So um, the su supply sector uh, grows based on costs. So uh, cost competitiveness is the major uh, source for um, power supply expansion. And uh, this whole um, model can be influenced by various levers. And we've looked at um, policy uh, switches and um, behavioral changes, technology interventions. So uh, this is the overview of the model structure. So uh, moving on to the developmental goals that we've looked at, um, here are, here's the list, food, housing, healthcare, education, cooking, transport, water, and power. So uh, these have been aligned with uh, the SDGs, and they also have a, a bearing on materials, resources, and uh, energy. We have um, set two levels of benchmarks for these goals. Uh, and it's also important to uh, remember that these goal benchmarks can be easily changed. We, it's like an input uh, to the model. 
So we've set it at two different levels just to see how the impacts would be. We've considered one desired quality of life benchmark, which I'll be referring to as DQOL. Um, over there, we've considered comfortable living standards in India, um, um, but it's contextual to India, comfortable living standards. Uh, in the ambitious uh, scenario, uh, benchmark, we look at um, OECD countries and uh, strive for international standards of living. So for example, if you look at the housing sector, we look at um, the size of an affordable housing unit to be uh, 40 meters square going up to 60 meters square in the DQOL benchmark, while in the ambitious it goes up to 100 meters square. Similarly, we've looked at different goals in these two uh, broad levels. So um, moving on to the scenarios that we've considered so far, um, in the business as usual, which is the reference case, um, historical trends and current policies continue. We find that uh, the goals are not met. Most of the DQOL or ambitious goals are not met, but it's, need it's also not sustainable or low carbon. So uh, we've explored three more scenarios. The DQOL and ambitious scenarios look at the DQOL and ambitious benchmarks that I just spoke about. Uh, but they don't have any additional sustainability levers or low carbon levers. So we also looked at a DQL sustainability scenario where these two, all the boxes are checked. So I'll talk about this uh, in the coming slides. Uh, so on this um, slide, I'm showing you the electricity demand, GHG emissions, and the power sector operating capacity in 2050. So um, if you look um, at the blue and um, black lines, uh, we find that uh, basically achieving the DQOL benchmarks is not a whole lot more energy intensive or emission intensive than BAU. So it's um, a less than uh, say 6 to 11% increase in electricity demand, um, very uh, small increase in GHG emissions. Even in terms of final energy demand, which I've not uh, shown here, um, is also a very small increase. Um, however, the ambitious benchmarks when we're striving for international standards of living um, really takes you uh, to a very high level. And so, in fact, the emissions go up to more than 9 billion tons in 2050. So uh, the ambitious benchmarks may uh, not be a very feasible strategy for India going forward and it's probably too resource intensive and um, unsustainable. Uh, so we focused on the DQOL benchmarks for the time being, and um, we looked at a scenario where these can be achieved at lower energy, lower water and material footprints. So uh, what are these interventions in the DQOL sustainability scenario? Uh, so in this graph, I'm showing you the uh, carbon emissions in 2050 between DQOL and DQOL sustainability and how these interventions have brought it down. So we find that in terms of a standalone intervention, um, using uh, shifting your construction materials to a little um, a different lower embodied energy, better thermal properties like um, AAC blocks in place of bricks, and we've looked at a few other combinations in this scenario, um, can bring down your emissions and energy demands by a lot because this also has an effect on bringing down the cooling demands in, uh, in the house. So up to 35% reductions are possible just by changing the material combinations. And um, in the transport sector, focusing on freight, um, shifting from road-based to rail-based freight has a significant impact. And um, water use efficiency strategies, especially in agriculture sector, has a, a pretty good impact. And so I'll talk about the water use in agriculture in the coming slides. So um, moving on to a few couple of sectoral uh, stories. So here um, uh, I'm just showing you a very simplified version of uh, the food and agriculture uh, linkage, um, sorry, food and water linkage. So here, um, based on the food security, um, uh, you know, your targets, food grain cultivation is uh, um, affected. So basically here, when you see an arrow mark with a plus sign, it means that they are positively correlated. And when there's a negative sign, they are inversely proportional. So I just want you to uh, focus on this um, loop here, if you can see my cursor. Um, as we grow more and more food grains and other crops like sugarcane or other needs like domestic industrial, the water demand is gonna keep increasing. And as we withdraw and consume more and more water, the availability of water is going to go down over time and uh, water stressed uh, situation is bound to happen, which will again feed back into food grain cultivation. So while food security is not a threat in, like, in the immediate future, as we keep uh, exploiting, over exploiting groundwater and uh, over time, this can start becoming an issue. So in this model, we've looked at a few interventions that can um, prevent this. 
So we have looked at uh, micro irrigation, so bringing about 34 million hectares under micro irrigation by 2050, uh, limiting sugarcane cultivation to what it is today and not growing too much after that. Um, and also explored a scenario where uh, we shift from uh, eating a very rice heavy uh, diet um, diets to coarse cereals and millets. So that also has other co-benefits, like it reduces water demands, but also saves um, your rice methane emissions because those are avoided. And they're also more climate resilient and healthy for um, people. And um, I might be running out of time, so I won't get into this, um, but the urban farm story that we've looked at to also quantify how cities can, uh, you know, if they grow horizontally and sprawl versus when they are um, more densely packed and uh, higher FSI, taller buildings. So they have different impacts on uh, residential energy, transport energy, land requirements. So we've tried to quantify these to see what the trade-offs would be and how we can avoid that and what kind of sustainable urbanization should we look forward to. So um, in terms of next steps, this is a work in progress. We are working on the power sector and also kind of making this, these integrated scenarios to finalize them. And eventually we want to make it a decision support system. So it, uh, put it up in, in the visualization platform uh, for uh, stakeholders to uh, visualize various scenarios and test various policies um, out. So with that, this is, um, I come to the end of the presentation. Now, these are all the contributors and um, this work wouldn't have been possible without each and every one of them. In particular, I just want to mention uh, Kaveri Purnaman Shweta from the CSTEP team, Kabir and Nihir who've been collaborating with us, our um, wonderful reviewers, and of course, the communications team. Thank you. I think, um, over to you again, Priyavrat. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks, thanks a lot, Ramya, for your interesting and very quick presentation. Uh, for the audience, I, I know this, uh, presentation was perhaps too brief. Uh, our attempt is to have a more interactive session, so hopefully some of the questions that you may have will get clarified. Uh, to summarize, this is the fundamental question for us. How do we balance the goals of immense development needs, sustainable use of resources, and moderating emissions to address the global climate crisis? So that's the question, how do we do this, basically? So we have a very distinguished uh, and, and diverse panel of experts here who will try to navigate through some of these questions uh, in the next 30, 35 minutes or so. Uh, before we begin, uh, let me introduce the panel. So we have uh, uh, with us uh, Mr. Arun Myra. He perhaps needs no introduction. He needs no introduction. He's, he he's belongs to a rare breed that has held top positions both in the public sphere as well as private sector. He's a former member of Planning Commission, and uh, he's, prior to that, he held uh, top executive positions in various startup companies, including Tata Motors. Uh, next, we also have uh, Ms. Samita Samada. She's, uh, she's an IS officer, and she's, she's an advisor, specifically looking at SDG goals uh, and the government initiatives around that at Niti Aayog. She was instrumental in preparing India's uh, voluntary national review, SDG index. So a lot of monitoring, tracking as we well setting the goals for SDG, that's the area of work. So very relevant to today's, today's discussions. Uh, next we have, uh, uh, I don't know whether Mr. Sandeep is still uh, there. I think he had left to leave early. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Siddharth Patak. He's the director of partnerships at the 2050 Pathways platform, where he oversees the platform's work supporting governments and stakeholders in developing long term scenarios. Uh, LTA, uh, 2050 Pathways platform has supported the previous phase of this project. He's also worked at, as head of politically, political advocacy at Can International, the political advisor at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in India. Uh, we, we also have Thomas Spencer, who is currently a fellow at the Energy and Resources Institute, Teddy, where his work explores India, Indian energy systems transition. He was formerly director of the Energy and Climate Change Program at the Institute of Sustainable Development and International Relations, and he has a long experience in energy and climate policy. So, so this is uh, this is the panel we have now. 
So that you also there. I can't see you. Hello. I'm here. Okay, great, great. So this is how I was planning to moderate the panel. Uh, I will first have a couple of questions for each of you. I'm going to take three to five minutes for your comments, but if you want to be brief, that's perfectly fine. Uh, next, I may have some follow-up questions for some of you. But since I said in the beginning that I would like it to be interactive, I would appreciate if uh, the panelists ask each other questions on this. And uh, we early in the day we did cover some of those questions, so it's, it's a nice segue to perhaps build on some of those some of those ideas which we discussed. Once we've done this these two rounds, uh, what we will do is we will essentially go to the audience, and uh, my colleagues will help me screen some of the questions and hopefully we can take some of them. Uh, the ones we can't, we'll, we'll try to give that to them on email. So that's the way we will try to run this panel. So let me first uh, go to uh, Sri Arun Mayala, because to me, it seems like this project, uh, the kind of work he's done uh, is exactly fits into our project's rationale. Uh, so you have worked extensively in systems thinking to tackle complex problems. Uh, indeed, this was your contribution to the planning commission also. So a couple of questions. First, would you explain, broadly speaking, how a systems approach to complex problem solving would help us reduce and manage this development versus climate target trade-offs? Uh, within that, I would like to add one more question, uh, which is basically in the context of developing India's development. What role can think tanks play in assisting and informing the policy making process? That's, so those are the two questions I would like to address to you. It you, sir. So you're, I think you're mute still. Yeah, is that okay? Yes, perfectly fine. Thank you, thank you very much, Apple. And thank you very much for those two questions. Hmm? Uh, system thinking and think tanks. Um, let me try and explain um, how I understand the power of systems thinking and what systems thinking is. So we are talking here, as uh, Mr. Prabhu put very well, about uh, events that we are seeing, a pattern of events, the fires in California, fires in Australia, um, as well as, you know, floods and typhoons. And the frequency of these and intensity of these is going up. Um, and as he pointed out, there's something that's causing this pattern of events, these trends. What is that? And I would say, since we're talking about the environment, uh, that is the ecological, the natural environment, here where I live in Gurgaon, we have had floods I don't want to go as far as thinking about California and Australia, right here, this year, which have uh, uh, swamped great concrete infrastructure that was developed the last year to provide uh, roads on which one could travel from one point of the city to another in a few minutes, where it was taking previously almost an hour. And so straight, flat, broad, goes through underpasses so you avoid any crossings. And two weeks ago, when the floods came, this road was completely unusable and some people lost their lives because their cars were trapped uh, in those underpasses. The floods came so fast and they didn't realize it. Why did this happen? It happened because we grew our GDP. How? Oh. Firstly, in leveling the lands and covering up the natural streams that were draining out water whenever there was large amounts of rains. We've had rains before. It's not the first time the rains have been like this, but that water used to go out in natural infrastructure. It didn't cost us anything to produce. Covering up that land and flattening it added to the GDP. And then on top of that, we built these lovely big buildings and the road that I talked about, doing all of which added to the GDP. And if I might say, 
after the floods, the repairs and the relief all added to the GDP. So we have added to the GDP while trying to develop in a model that we think is development. So there are two things happening here. We've created structures, which are the structures of with concrete that I put out just now, which have caused that flooding to happen. And why did we create those structures? Because we have a belief that man-made engineering is the solution to the problems that we have, right? And it adds to the GDP, of course. So I come to this word science, which Mr. Prabhu used, that science must find the uh, solutions. I'm going to say, just to challenge everybody, science has caused the problems that we are now trying to solve with science. We need a different sort of science. The present science, which is breaking things into parts, which is used to understand the parts. Also the present science, which is used to create technology and engineering to overcome nature, we must stop using it, at least in the way we are using it. We need a science which connects things together, understands shapes and patterns, and not the composition of parts, molecules, and small parts of our reality. Science has got so specialized, and technology is also so specialized, that if you want to be respected as a scientist, you've got to know a lot about very little, more than everybody else does. Those people who understand generally what's going on are considered to be backward, not fully scientific. So change minds. So systems thinking is about recovering a way of thinking, which is a natural way of thinking. This is how nature works. It connects things. It puts things together and creates solutions whereby all parts of nature can work together. Okay, because it lets things work together. So systems thinking is about thinking of the relationships amongst many things. And this is what is very necessary now. We have broken up development, as I said earlier, into parts. And we've emphasized too much development in terms of material growth, GDP growth. So first, let's rethink what do we mean by development? Increasing our GDP to 5 trillion, would that make us more developed if meanwhile, as well, we already are doing pretty badly, destroying the environment even worse and creating further inequalities and poverty in the system? That won't be development, but we measure the goal like that. So step back, what's the established, what's the goal that we want to achieve? And putting many things together to think of the relationships between things, that's systems thinking, simply put. And systems thinking requires you to go beneath the events to see what are the structures that are causing those trends, and then think about why we create those structures down to our beliefs. Think tanks. Think tanks, there are many think tanks. I think the four or five people sit under a tree and reflect on the state of the world are a think tank. But we won't respect them as a think tank. We want people who get a lot of data and do you know, secondary research mostly and put out graphs and stuff and write papers. Those are people doing thinking. But as I pointed out, they are not doing systemic thinking. They are just investigating things through a tool that they know, which is quantitative analysis and modeling. And we need something different, which is systems thinking and systems modeling. What is the role of think tanks today? The think tanks must be catalysts to enable many different people and many different uh, parts of society to be able to think together. So think tanks that can provide a starting point to say, well, here are many things that should be thought together. And as we put these things together, the following pictures emerge about what could happen if we keep these things disconnected and what we might be able to create if we keep in our minds and our actions these things harmonizing with each other. So the role of think tanks is twofold. One is changing the way they think. And the second is seeing their role in society, not to provide sharp solutions, intellectual solutions, but to 
provide a node and the skills for that node to convene larger conversations where many stakeholders can understand the system of which they are a part and which they may be destroying by their own individual actions, not understanding the impact of their actions on the system as a whole. Those are my two thoughts. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. I mean, it's, uh, uh, I will come back to this uh, interesting idea about uh, the, the way you think of how civil society can engage and be the catalyst to, to provide or get to solutions and not really start focusing on qualitative analysis which is kind of advice to give the solution. Uh, and I think this is this is a very valid way of looking at things and then a useful participatory way of decision making. I'll come back to this again, this question, because this is, this is important. I'll next go to uh, Ms. Sayukta Samadhar. Uh, you have led the work of Niti IO, which is the nodal agency of SDG. Niti came out with the SDG index, which measures progress, and, uh, and, and also you worked on monitoring capacity. And this issue of SDG to me is a natural segue from what uh, Mr. Meyer just mentioned, which is essentially what exactly is the development you're talking about? Because in absence of the right framework, uh, we could be just obviously doing wrong things. So uh, you have worked on framing SDGs, you know, what the country's goals should be. Based on your involvement in creating and working the SDG, can you tell us if there has been a meaningful shift in the focus on SDGs driving policy priority? As opposed to the traditional you know, model, which is let's work on GDP, as sort of um, Mr. Myra just mentioned. And those GDP and macroeconomic policies will drive the eventually the you know what the development needs are housing or housing. So that's the first question. I mean, what is what is happening in the uh, in, in your view in the in the policy world right now? Uh, that's the first one. So fundamentally, again, just to just to compress this question, we just want to understand if 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 uh, SDG goals is playing a bigger role in driving macroeconomic policies and planning, and how? So over to you, Ms. Samadha. Thank you, Prabhat, and uh, thank you once again for having me in this and uh, you know letting Hi. the government and Niti have to share the perspective. Uh, so uh, there has been a very rich kind of conversation around uh, how the entire discourse on climate and development has to be balanced, and Arun sir has has very uh, beautifully kind of laid out the you know the the, the importance of system thinking here uh, so uh, let me uh, get back to the question that you particularly asked so uh, as as you've kind of mentioned it is uh, the this this body which is again uh, the government think tank <laughs> uh, uh, quite a corollary to the the think tanks which are you know working in this entire uh, development policy so as the government think tank and as the nodal body for uh, supervising the entire SDG agenda, not only for the country but also at the at the international fora. Well, uh, the kind of work that we've involved in, we have definitely, definitely seen a, a huge paradigm shift in terms of you know the movement from uh, all uh, government policy, public policy, focusing on entire in, on, on GDP or on per capita growth, to a much more developmental paradigm which focuses on. The, all the three dimensions of development, the social, the economic, and environmental, and also takes into account the trade-off, the, the, you know, the balancing act between the synergies and the trade-off between all the three uh, pillars. So uh, very uh, frequently, I mean, we all know that there is a trade-off in both conventional thinking, so there is a trade-off in both between the economic goals of industry, uh, infrastructure, and let me say the environmental goals like climate and sustainability, sustainable, responsible uh, consumption and production. However, this thinking has been largely changing as we can all see when we are working with, you know, with, with different state governments also and with think tanks and with different stakeholders, whether it's the civil society or the community-based organizations or even the private sector to, uh, to put a, um, a focus on that. So the, the gap, the change which we have seen, primarily we started, you know, the work in 2018 in terms of developing, in terms of trying to shift the focus in, uh, because see, for the, in the SDGs and the, the sustainable development goals to succeed, it is the, the primary need which was felt was that it has to be translated in terms of priorities at the level of the states, at the level of the districts, 
and decentralize and localize uh, localizing the SDG. So with that, we kind of developed this model of uh, SDG monitoring mechanism where we would, uh, you know, uh, we created the entire paradigm of a monitoring framework which focuses on all the 16 goals, particularly focusing on the social, economic, and environmental. And this, and then, and, and then measuring the progress of uh, the various states and the and the union territories on it. So a ranking and an indexing definitely leads to a spirit of competition, which we could see uh, uh, immediately after every ranking that comes out, that there's a furor amongst the states, and, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, talk which focuses on this, on the, the, the ranking. So this kind of a competitiveness, uh, that, uh, I think, that was uh, one of the key drivers which brought the attention of the policymakers in the states at the at the level of the chief, the chief ministers, the chief secretaries, and that brought into the table the entire SDG agenda and the need to move away from just in uh, government expenditure or just the inputs in various schemes and more towards outcomes and towards broader need for horizontal and vertical coherence in order to get these various outcomes whether it's social whether it's related to the health sanitation and gender or whether it's related to the economic whether of growth of infrastructure of jobs livelihoods and also the responsibility and the sustainable consumption and production patterns so these became and came at the forefront of the agenda as a result of a continuous monitoring i mean we do go by the principle that finally whatever gets measured gets done and I think that uh, that helped us in kind of delving the fact that uh, monitoring at the highest level of the chief ministers and chief secretaries has to move away from just government expenditure and uh, spending and uh, you know uh, amount of budget allocated towards greater goods, which outcomes, which will actually impact the lives of all communities living in the in the, uh, wherever they are. So that's one thing I wanted. But uh, more than this, uh, we also kind of focused on in terms of you know creating capacities, creating because this this entire thing of working with the states in terms of localizing the SDGs, integrating them and aligning them with their developmental priority, that needed a lot of capacity building, needed a lot of institution building. In government, I sort would all, or, I mean everybody would knows that there is a lot a lot less talking within the departments. And also across, you know, when you go down vertically, so there was a need for uh, because the SDGs are so intertwined and so interlinked. So the the need for was felt tremendously that there is a need for institutionalizing structures which will cut across these uh, these uh, compartments and silos and create uh, forms of you know horizontal and vertical coherence. And that is why we we you know it, it's heartening to say that. Uh, 26 states develop these institutional structures which we uh, which are called by their various names which are largely the sdg coordination centers and these sdg coordination centers in these 26 states they are very, they play a very pivotal role in terms of uh, cutting across different uh, uh, you know different departments different ministries and even different uh, bodies which are engaged in this work and reaching out to think tanks and private sector in terms of building in this engagement process so that all efforts converge and coincide and synergies are built in terms of achieving these various uh, policy goals so having said so apart from these institutional structures also it is uh, interesting to note that you know uh, sdgs have become a very important agenda because now uh, uh, 16 states, yeah, the figures of 16 states have actually aligned their budgets with the SDGs and their targets. I think this is a tremendous uh, achievement because even in government of India, our uh, union budget is still not aligned and, you know, it doesn't, uh, it's not aligned. It's, it's, the budget is still as per department, but it's not aligned with the SDGs and the SDG targets. So this, when 16 states have done it, so I think we, uh, we were able to uh, kind of grill this and push this from in the last three, four years, and we've been able to achieve that. So this coordination amongst these departments and built and uh, this, the springing up of institutional structures at the level of the districts, at the level of the state capitals, creating monitoring mechanisms at way high up at the level of the policymaker, at the level of the decision makers in the states who focus 
primarily on SDGs on a regular basis. I think that has been one of the uh, key achievements and key drivers which has shifted the focus uh, from just the economic policy towards a more holistic policy in terms of the development. I would also like to mention here uh, one of the latest developments is that you know, poverty again in India is generally measured, used to be measured by the, the monetary terms of uh, uh, the per capita expender, consumption expenditure. However, now uh, the thinking has evolved and we move, we're moving uh, very fast towards uh, defining poverty more in terms of a multidimensional uh, concept, which takes into account deprivations across various sectors of health and nutrition, uh, education, living standards, living standards, which has all these sectors which are, you know, built up in, in the safari model of electricity, drinking water, sanitation, food, and uh, assets. So uh, these are the, some of the core, the ways in which, you know, again, our policy focus is shifting from uh, just the uh, economic concept to a much more holistic and comprehensive concept in terms of lifestyles, which is again, part of the desired quality of life, which you are talking about. So these are happening a lot uh, in the in the policy arena and not only in the uh, in the union government but also in the state. What is interesting is that these things are getting replicated in the field. So just like uh, as I said, we are we are developing. You know, we are trying to spruce up the spirit of competition amongst the states so that they compete more and more in terms of in in all the SDGs. What it is, it, we are also taking it one step further down. Basically, we are, we are encouraging, we are working with the states, we are handholding uh, the states in terms of developing the same kind of a model which focuses on, on this holistic and comprehensive definition of development with inclusive growth and the sustainability across their own districts. So, so that the policymakers can actually, you know, monitor and push and also handhold in terms of in, in, in terms of improving and accelerating these achievements at the level of the district. So these are a couple of points that I had to share with you at this point. Uh, thank you. I'm almost tempted to ask a follow-up question because I, I was interesting the you know use of let's say competition to push various stakeholders. Whereas uh, uh, Myra sir had talked about also a different approach of participatory. And uh, but but I will hold it for the moment and come back perhaps to that because I want to get also Siddharth's view uh, and of course Thomas Spencer. So uh, uh, Siddharth, you have uh, spoken about the you know, importance of what you talk about, the inevitability of climate change. And, you know, you worked in different countries about, on, on basically uh, developing long-term scenarios, et cetera, for climate change. So, you know, I'm going to shift gears because that's the third leg of the stool, so to speak. So I just want to get your, based on your experiences working with other countries, what is your perspective uh, on uh, use of this systemic system based model such as safari to to uh, let, let's say open up a discussion and maybe even uh, contribute to policy making etc uh, and, and you specifically there are two link questions right uh, on this which i would like you to reflect on one is that uh, if in your experiences if these development goals have again impacted broad economic policies just like the way we talk about india and second is if 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 there's any role they played in the long-term scenarios of trading policy. So those two those two kind of specific questions. So so that what do you? Thank you, Privat. Um, uh, so good afternoon, everyone. I think um, um, if I was to start with the um, the question on the systems uh, modeling as such, I think the. Uh, in the experience that we've seen across different countries uh, there are obviously different modeling teams with very high levels of capacity who are undertaking uh, different types of models uh, what has been very very evident is that the models cannot uh, be uh, are not accurate so you cannot have a model that is accurate across a time frame of 30 years with the sort of dynamism that you're seeing in most of the developing country economies, but along with the sort of constraints as well as uh, sort of surprises that climate change throws up. Uh, so just to sort of give you an example, a lot of the natural resources that you take in as a, as a threshold within the current model at C-STEP 
will have will be impacted one way or the other through climate change and we don't know what that it, uh, the level or the degree of that impact on these natural resources would be which then will have a sort of a feedback into uh, the larger <clears throat> resource constraints that a government or a country might face so i think one has to sort of look at uh, a model for the long term strategy or for that matter for long term planning in a way that allows it to fulfill two or three objectives i think one is to sort of give a good direction of travel uh two is to sort of factor in as many sort of uh, constraints as well as uh, sort of surprises that might come in the way uh, and three is uh, the sense of awareness and usability or simplicity of the results uh, because at the end of the day a policy maker is not going to look at a 30 year horizon to develop a policy a policy maker if you're looking at the legislative policy makers they'll probably look at a 5 to 10 year cycle uh, or maybe the executive will look slightly longer uh, but at the end of the day uh, it it's important that whatever the results of the model are and how you're sort of portraying or visualizing those results can actually be helpful for policy makers to take a more informed decision so it's primarily to sort of inform decision making not to necessarily prescribe the policy that should be taken i think in that sense a systems dynamic model is quite helpful because it sort of produces uh, very starkly some of the choices and the trade-offs uh, that might emerge and the levers especially could be very useful uh, in understanding the sort of uh, policy insight or policy awareness that is required uh, to develop policies that could go either ways i think the social behavior side of things is much more complicated uh especially when you're looking at shifting uh, social behavior and practices but i think the insights that a systems dynamic model can provide uh, especially in countries like india as well as other developing countries that are very dynamic in their current economic uh, sort of structure as well as development paradigm uh is is quite helpful that is not to say that the the other side the cge modeling is not uh, helpful but it's to say that when we're looking at these sort of decision making over a course of 30 years it'll be good to sort of have the government equipped with different types of models and different types of insights that approach the problem from different perspectives and different directions of travel um, so i think from this the systems dynamic model and the approach that you're using especially taking into account the development imperatives of the country i think that would give a very interesting insights on many of the parameters uh, that a traditional CG model might not necessarily uh, uh, deliver um, as such. So that's, I think, the first base. I think in most, if you're looking at experiences across different countries, the best examples or the best strategies have actually used multiple models. They haven't used a singular model. They've used multiple models for different aspects of the problem uh, and basically have used these different models and the modeling teams obviously try to talk to each other and have common assumptions around specific things especially around the economic growth dimension but i think the success for a long-term strategy is premised on how the government is able to see uh, from an insights perspective different uh, uh, sort of options that are laid out across the modeling community uh, and not necessarily choosing or bearing only one singular model in itself um, i think on the development uh, developmental goals uh, and the economic policy part of it um we've sort of always well we've largely maintained that uh, gdp uh, we've given a primacy to GDP, uh, when it comes to development and i think the sustainable development goals came a long way in unpacking the developmental milestones and i think sanyukta sort of talked about it very well that when you're actually sort of creating these development milestones at the national but also at the sub-national level i think it gives a very good uh, peg uh, for policy development to happen in the country in itself i think for a country like india where we still don't know where and how we are going to be positioned in the world with the sort of opportunities and constraints uh, climate change will present uh, it, it is a good sort of indicator that these are the sort of milestones that we have to achieve in the course of our growth story or our development story. 
I think the the bit that becomes complicated is how do you achieve these developmental goals, and whether you want to sort of do it at the cost uh, of ignoring uh, certain uh, sustainability practices, or whether you actually try to maybe achieve these developmental goals in sync with the sort of uh, sustainability as well as climate change imperatives uh, that will likely happen. So. Uh, to me, it's it's extremely important to see how uh, these developmental goals and whatever we set for ourselves uh, in India are actually uh, achieved in a way that emits the least amount of carbon, uh, actually creates the infrastructure that does not necessarily lead to a carbon lock-in, uh, and is not necessarily uh, the the achievement of the development goals is not necessarily premised on a certain um percentage of the gdp or the gdp growth it uh, it is actually premised on other indicators of well-being uh, that are now becoming quite prevalent uh, across the world uh, including uh, the human development index um so i think gdp is important and the gdp growth rate and things like that is important but i do think that that's part of a larger one piece of the larger puzzle uh, and I think uh, with the SDGs and development goals obviously give a good indicator of a milestone for 2030 or at least in a decadal sort of a manner, we know from now to 2030 where we want to go. But it'll be great to also have milestones for beyond uh, because some of the decisions will require us to have that sort of a foresight. And this model obviously could potentially point in that direction as to what those uh, milestones in 2035, 2040 could look like, which will also determine a lot of the infrastructure decisions that are very long time bearing uh, and what those infrastructure decisions should be like. So I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, uh, thanks. I'll pick a couple of uh, uh, threads from your, your comments for, for Thomas to pick on. So a few things. One is that, that most models are wrong in the sense that they're not supposed to give an answer absolutely right and we're doing a range of exercise to get some direction direction idea so that's the point and and i think thomas you've worked a lot on energy system models etc and, and i think one of the things which i want to take forward is that obviously the it starts narrowing down to once you have the sdg goals you've got climate challenge so what is the energy demand because that's what's eventually driving our ghg emissions and things like that the thing is that the way I, uh, Indian energy policy and modeling is working is somewhat more deterministic, prescriptive, seems to me. And I wanted to uh, get your inputs on this, that whether this kind of exercise can add color and value to, to energy modeling and energy policies in India, um, uh, especially electricity markets, et cetera, what is happening. So that's, that's, that's what I wanted. Thanks uh, very much, Ayana. Just making sure that uh, I'm audible. Yes, you are perfectly fine. Thank you. So um, let me answer your question with a one sentence answer and then I'll expand on it. Uh, the answer is yes, this exercise can be tremendously useful for energy modeling uh, in India. Um, where energy modeling is understood as a, a narrow exercise looking at energy demand and supply. And I'll just spend a few minutes uh, explaining why I think the answer to that question is yes. So, uh, you know, I'm coming at the perspective of someone who is very interested in mitigating climate change because I think uh, climate change is already uh, a tremendously risky uh, proposition for India and will only get uh, more so. But Coming at it with that lens, uh, in the Indian context, you know, as a developing country which is still relatively poor in per capita terms and which still has a lot of its development transition still to go, what matters for India's capacity to mitigate climate change is uh, what occurs outside of climate policy in the strict sense, right? Um, if you take a look at you know where China is now, uh, China has already locked into a large, large share of its emitting infrastructure, its um, productive capacity, its development model. This is not the case in India. Uh, there is still so much investment still to make 
there is still so much of these large scale transitions of urbanization, industrialization, demographic transition, formalization of the economy that still uh, have to occur. And how those processes occur will have a huge impact on India's material and energy demand. Um, so exploring the potentially wide range of outcomes of those large socioeconomic transition processes that India still faces is essential for energy modeling. It is not complementary, it is essential. And I think too often uh, energy modelers, uh, and I'm speaking particularly of you know, the, the ones that use large global energy systems model and try to quantificate on things of relevance to India, they take simple GDP projections and then use that to drive their models. But what really matters is what is behind that GDP projection for India? You know, is it a high industrialization, high investment, a high urbanization, high materials demand um, uh, a pattern of, of growth, or is it something quite different? Let me give you one example from India's recent economic history. In uh, 2000, uh, the business uh, processes and financial services sectors made up 6% of India's GDP. In 2016, they made up about 15%. Uh, these are two very skill intensive, low materials footprint sectors with low impacts on energy demand and, and, and materials demand. And the fact that their share in India's GDP doubled in the period 2000 to 2016 has a really material impact on uh, India's energy intensity and emissions, right? Um, so if you look at you know, a comparison between India and China, India's energy intensity is about 20% lower than China's. And if you do a decomposition of analysis of why this is so, half of that difference is due to the higher share of industry in G India's GDP. And the other half of that difference is due to the higher uh, energy intensity of China's industrial background, right? Uh, and that is simply the fact that China produces so much steel cement because of its very resource intensive, energy intensive. Um, uh, urbanization and, and um, uh, you know, physical development model. So all of this to say, and I'll, I'll end here, I think these kind of exercises need to be the starting point of energy modeling. You have to think about development first. You have to think about the physical reality of the world that you're trying to represent first. I think there is one rule that we should come up with for energy modeling in India, which is Talk in energy units last. Don't talk in exajoules. Don't talk in million tons of oil equivalent. Talk in physical units first. Tons of steel, tons of cement, passenger kilometers, freight kilometers, uh, floor space. Let's talk about the physical reality of the world that we are trying to present first. Let's try and link that with the development story. And then you can start to talk in uh, units of, of energy and emission. But development first. Uh, thank you. I'll, what I'm going to do is perhaps uh, uh, launch an open question, which is but perhaps more in a way targeted at uh, Ms. Samandar and uh, Mr. Maira. And this is in reference to uh, how does one take this uh, work, which is uh, has multiple uh, challenges, let's say, and multiple stakeholders forward. And I just want to link back to, in a way, what Tom Spencer was just talking about, which is the India's energy policy. And as uh, some of us all know, that India's energy policy, which was basically prepared by Niti Ayo, is still in the ground. And I think one of the reasons is that, perhaps, again, is that the multiple stakeholders, and how do we get them to participate? How do we how, how do we get to a participatory process? And this goes back to the same issue as SDG goals, where Niti Ayo is a you know, notary agency. Uh, well, we looked at one, okay, we get the states to push ahead. But uh, fundamentally, till we address this, we can do all this modeling and, and all kinds of exercises. That's where, uh, that's where we want to understand and take your views. What should we do about, about, about uh, this exercise and this kind of assets? Problems which spans across the economic breadth. Oh, okay. Uh, so you, 
on mute, I think. Ah, now on mute. Yes. Okay, thank yes. you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I wanted to say, Samyukta, when you were speaking, you were making me sing. You know, what she described is what, when I left the Planning Commission, we left a blueprint of what we thought should replace the Planning Commission, which was a think tank, giving advice and budgets and big prescriptions. And what she described was creating, as she said, capacities in the districts, capacities in the states to have, like you said, coordination amongst different parts. That is what we felt should be the role of a nodal agency. And since you're talking about think tanks, that's exactly the illustration. A think tank has to enable results to happen, not prescribe and say, see, we pontificated. Now you politicians, you got a problem. It's always just politicians who are the problem. We economists know the solution. Okay, so that's the way to go. Second point, very so clearly. If I may add, so if so, if I may yes. add, uh, it's now a think tank without giving the budget. That was your time when the planning commission would give the budget to the states. No, no, we weren't. Now, we think tank, that. You think tank of a different sort, exactly. If you have to think of the prescription, you will also have to say how much resource is required in the prescription. So that becomes actually. Mm -hmm. The amount of money required is limited by the way you think. There's no innovation here. When you get people locally and they say my resources are constrained and these are my requirements, they're able to match resource with their specific requirements much more efficiently. Okay, that's the way to develop with less resources and get the right outcomes everywhere. So I'm saying I, I must learn from you and talk to you afterwards how you're doing this. The second point is link to what she's saying. The SDGs. They do say at the end, 17th goal, the way to address all these 16 things which are in economics and they are in the social side as the way and the environmental side is partnerships. The partnerships are necessary in each of them between different types of stakeholders in environmental issues, economic issues and so on, but amongst them also. Now to get all this, a big matrix up there to say how do you coordinate so many interactions is impossible. And you'll get the wrong solution which won't fit everybody. It's locally where you say, well, what are the relevant SDGs that matter here? Who are the stakeholders whose needs are affected by these SDGs and whose behaviors and actions need to change? We together, like Irina Ostrom would say, you know, we learn to manage our commons. But well, that's the way to go. We need local system solutions developed collaboratively by communities there to solve these big global systemic SDG problems too. The third is, and Samyukta, when we were finishing the planning commission, we realized that by looking at why India doesn't progress, we have the best thinkers, maybe not the best think tanks and economists, so we get the big solutions from the best think tanks outside. We can't implement and said so India's problem is implementation. So we looked at industry, we looked at our environmental issues, everything. The problem in implementation of good policy always came the confusion, there was lack of coordination amongst various agencies. The second was contention among stakeholders who feel different needs with respect to the same matter. So we said, being scientific here, are there means of converting confusion to coordination and converting contention to cooperation? And this is okay, you will say an organizational and social matter. Of course there are. I mean, within industry, we know some industries do this companies better than others do. That's where I came. But we said, let's look internationally. And so with the help of the World Bank, we said, look, we don't want your prescriptions and advice. We want you to tell us where we can learn how to convert confusion into coordination in policy and implementation, as well as contention to cooperation among stakeholders. And we know, let's go backwards. If some countries are developing environment uh, well, I mean, not damaging the environment, improving it while they're growing the living standards of people, as well as more inclusion. Let's work backward. They must be doing this because it's a coordinated matter. So you, let's pick the countries that are progressing the best on this multifaceted way, and then ask them, how do they coordinate? How do they get cooperation? Now, 
you know the countries. You can do that, and many people have done which are the countries that advance the fastest, and you're doing the same, I'm sure. But asking those countries like we asked Sweden and Germany, who historically have done well on these matters, how do you do it? They said it's culture. They said, okay, no, no. We have to get systems in place of culture, and that becomes our culture, then that's the way we do it. And this is with the help of the World Bank. We went to them, interviewed them, had them here, had them debate with each other. What could they learn from each other, but how to improve their coordination any further? We had thinkers of the world, because the World Bank said, we're going to give you some money to implement this. It's going to be not very large, but money. It's such a strange idea. We want it to be vetted before we give the money by Danny Rodericks, Francis Fukuyama, Charles Sable, and Prabhupada Mushtaq Singh. This is going to be the vetting group to say the idea that the small group in the Planning Commission of India has come up with is the right idea for India and could be an idea the rest of the world could use. And I would say this to you, they helped us to improve it and said, they've never seen such a lovely solution to such a complex problem. It's simple. It's about people working together, but learning how to do it more effectively. So that is an ethereo tells people, use systems thinking, understand why you don't collaborate. You can think about it. Change your behavior to work with others for the sake of a common good. It's there. It's not difficult. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Savala, <laughs> you want to add something? Uh, uh, yes, yes, definitely. Fear that in those five minutes, I definitely could not touch upon, you know, the, the our SDG work and also the collaboration that we do. So thank you for giving me the question and the opportunity. Uh, so uh, yes, definitely seamless collaboration amongst multiple stakeholders is the hallmark of NITIO, particularly when it comes to the SDG agenda. So here I, 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 last, I just spoke about the, you know, the government, uh, the union government ministries and the subnational governments and the district level governments and the urban local bodies. However, now it's, it's more than just the government. So we have a very structured, uh, you know, a method of interacting and continuously engaging with the business sector, the innovators, particularly from the private sector, and think tanks and academia, and most importantly, the community-based organizations and the civil society organizations. So a very quick example of this, I would just like to share. When we did, uh, you know, India presented its second voluntary national review on the SDGs in July uh, this year. We just made the presentation. And this was, a, a, this is a country's uh, progress, voluntary, you know, progress report on how the country has fared from the last VNR, which happened in 2017 uh, till 2020. So it is not a government report. So I would really encourage and appeal that you could have a look at our um, VNR report, uh, which is on our NITI website. It, it was a product, uh, it was a culmination of uh, consultations held across you know eight months thank god covid had not hit at that time and so we could actually have 50 consultations spread across the length and breadth of the country in tier two tier three cities and it covered 14 community groups women elderly the scsts be notified tribes transgenders I mean, uh, uh, you know, urban migrants and uh, workers. So it was it's across all these 14 community groups that we had these 50 consultations. And out of this, a rich body of issues and knowledge and experience came up. And that was amazing. Because then, uh, you know, we, we ensured that uh, we have a small team in NITI. We have a team of uh, five people, and every member could at least, you know, attend and represent NITI. Listen, it was a huge. It was one of the country's largest listening exercise. I think we had one such exercise during the 12th plan period midterm evaluation. After that, I think this was the largest uh, listening exercise that we uh, we did in the country. And this was uh, uh, because it was just not 50 consultations which NITI kind of you know endorsed. Every community had a series of network you know branching down you know uh, uh, district level, city level. So a, a community like uh, the, the let me say the children communities, the community organizations which which were working for the children and amongst children's groups, they had simultaneously five, six consultations down the line. And then it merged into, you know, one national consultation. So these are the kind, so it was a rich body of uh, 
uh, you know, issues which came up. And I can also share some of the issues which were very mind boggling for us also. Things like there is absolute lack of disaggregated data, community wise, granularity with granularity. So you do not have data systems which capture the issues of most of these communities, forest dwellers, where do we have the data? So such amazing, uh, then apart from this, so where is the feedback mechanism of taking the structure in a structured way, the feedback of these different communities which are at risk of being vulnerable or at risk of being, you know, left in the pace of development. There is no feedback system. So whatever it is, it's a question of just checks and most state governments would just mark a check to it. Okay, have you heard it? But actually that it's missing in the field. So the kind of realities that and the issues which came up with, and we have honestly put these issues in our report, which was made in the United Nations and which was, you know, which was made public in the public domain. And this uh, this came up after a, a, a whole series of consultations with these community groups and these uh, stakeholders. So and, and we kind of uh, uh, structured this, you know, we solidified this entire process of participation of these community groups, these the business stakeholders. Uh, into a into a structured process where we have a community based forum in Nipia, which is called the CSO Forum, which has representatives of every uh, uh, community working in these areas and in different sectors. So I, I I'm quite kind of really proud to say at least that we've been able to curate a process in which the participation and active engagement of various groups finally these what the you know the seeds of development the fruits of development where do they go who's the barometer of measurement it's these sections which are at risk and are always at the fringes these are the sections who are actually tell us what has been the you know the uh, the the result of the development process so we've been able to curate that and this is only with about the community which i'm very passionate about in terms of working but yes we are also in the process of uh, we worked with the business uh, sector in uh, we are still working with them and the business sector we are coming up with a huge study in terms of how the business sector has matured in terms of their contribution and understanding of the entire SDG agenda moving beyond the you know the minimum the corporate social responsibility because if you if you talk even in terms of SDG in the business sector it entirely boils down even today towards the sustainability standards maybe or just the CSR use so that is ad hocism. So we are trying to build in the sustainability standards, the GRI standards, and the the, uh, the national voluntary guidelines on business uh, responsible business into these business processes. In and we are trying to do a study and working with these top hundred listed companies. So there's a lot more to you know in terms of engagement with the community, with the civil society. And but yes, the time is always a constraint. But we are happy to take this conversation further and. We are, we are really uh, hopeful that you will have a look at our work also uh, so that you know this and that is why I think this modeling exercise is interesting but it has to be taken back to the uh, you know for feedback for uh, uh, inputs and suggestions out in the public domain where, where actually people can engage with and give their honest feedback and that is where we learn I mean that's where the learning experience comes in. Thank you very much. I mean, it's fascinating listening to you because it's clear that you're really passionate about this work. So I think that's sometimes a rarity, you know, get lost in our own uh, work. But it's so wonderful. Uh, if others have any questions, uh, Thomas or uh, Siddharth, or you know, you guys to each other. Uh, that. One area I did uh, could not cover partly because uh, something wasn't there is this issue of uh, you know, the, the SDG goals, in some sense, are a little more tangible. You know, it, you can build a little bit of, let's say, um, traction with politics and, and the public. Climate becomes a little more harder challenge because it's not clear to people, and, and therefore, uh, how the LTS scenarios, what kind of public support we build, what kind of how these models can basically say that, listen, if you don't do this, this is impact is. But uh, I don't know if anybody, one of you wants to make a comment on that issue, we did not yet cover it, but, but uh, that was the only point I thought was, was, was remaining. But thank you very much for your comments. Any other questions from uh, uh, Tom, Thomas, anything from you or Siddharth? Seems, no, nothing uh, from my side. Uh, okay. It's been a very rich discussion. Yeah, yeah, so I, I look forward to it.
Sure, uh, Samadhar, yes, please. Yes, uh, to, just to your, uh, uh, you know, your uh, observation, uh, climate change is very much a part of the SDGs. It is SDG 13 and it is SDG 12, right. which is responsible consumption and production. So we are trying to, you know, actually build it. And when we, when we do the ranking of the states uh, every year, so there are a stringent set of parameters you know, it ranges from uh, impact of climate uh, adaptation and mitigation, your share of renewables, your carbon dioxide and your emissions and all the NDCs. So it, it is completely integrated into the SDG agenda. So please don't say, please don't feel that these get left behind. So in SDG parlance, it's that no goal and no sector yeah. left behind. So definitely no, I, not, I'm sure, not, I'm not sure left the behind. I mean, obviously, uh, what I meant was that the, the general public and political process is not, uh, you know, it's harder to build, track. that's all I meant, but I know, of course, uh, that's, uh, that's that's so, so I think, uh, uh, we're talking about communicating the scenarios, the language we use from the West, we started to associate climate change, yes, with carbon, and the images were about the icebergs and the polar bears, okay? Now, we are affected and if you want people's behavior to change and cooperation, they said water disappearing is caused by climate change. Yes. No, no. What are you doing about carbon in the air? That's to come to our situation in India. If we do the right things by nature, whatever part of nature that we interact with and are using, we are helping the climate problem, right? And just to isolate it to so scientifically, it's become a science like again. Climate means carbon and energy therefore which is more what you're modeling but like we said energy is related to many other things so please it's embedded behind please stop saying are you dealing with climate and if i don't use the word climate in every sdgs you'll say i'm not dealing with climate but you won't allow me to use in every sdg you say it's a separate vertical how are you allocating to climate change no no okay this is system thinking that i can conclude with that thank you thank you last word is yours thank you sir. and uh, Thank you very much, uh, sir, and thank you, Ms. Samdar, and uh, also, uh, I can't see them anymore, Siddharth, as well as Thomas Spencer, a wonderful conversation we had, very engaging, but we are running out of time, so thanks again, and uh, uh, Shweta and Ramya, but uh, Jay is also here, so again, this was a very engaging discussion, which is what I was hoping for, and we got it. Thanks again. Jay, any, any, any last do, do we have any questions from the audience? I know we've uh, completely forgotten about them, it seems like. I think uh, we have to. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we, I think we should close, but there's a question on how to formulate climate change literacy campaigns from school children to bureaucrats. And uh, since line departments don't necessarily move together on this, uh, this is from Mr. V. Ganapati. I, I'd like to say that I, I'm, I'm telling you from experience. In 2004-05, when the climate change agenda became very big, and I used to travel to Sweden and to Canada and to, well, the country which were in the lead at that time. And this is the images we got there. And I got little books and said, spread them in your schools. And they say, the children there, you tell them, climate, do you know carbon goes, there's a layer up there. And by the way, the polar bear pictures and the ice flows. What does it mean to them? But when you let them speak about what matters to them, and they begin to say, especially the poorer family children, that ki bahut zarurat hai, ghar mein. sanitation. So these are connected with the system, you see. So start with the people, ask them what matters. <laughs> and they will tell you that things with nature matter. And they'll have the solution in which they'll find the balance between not misusing nature while trying to increase their livelihoods, for which we've designed jobs which require them to use material and all those things, you know, come on, come on. Don't say local system solutions are going to be the solution to climate. Please put it in the backdrop. It's a part of the whole. Thanks over to you, Jay. No, no, absolutely. In fact, uh, uh, sir, if the last comment on one of the things that we have also is how do we communicate our results as we develop the results, develop our scenarios? How do we communicate our results so that people can take the best out of out of that? I think that's going to be an important uh, aspect, and I'll definitely look forward to your comments and everyone on the on the committee here. 
uh, on how we can take these results and, and communicate it better to the public so that we can have a good discussion, a dialogue, and as you say, get to that place of cooperation, get to that place of coordination in order to achieve what we need to achieve. Thanks. So with that, we'll end today's discussion. Thanks again to all of you, and uh, uh, thanks to the audience also. It's been, again, a wonderful uh, last two, three hours of this dialogue, and we hope to take this work forward. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll obviously be in touch with uh, you, Ms. Samadhar, and of course, Shri Mayra, as well as other panelists also. So again, thanks again. Thank, Thank you, everyone. So Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.